and uh, it is <laughs> uh, welcome everybody to the uh, September 9th uh, regular board meeting of the uh, Edmonton Metro Transit Services Commission board and uh, just for everybody's information uh, we are uh, live streaming and a reminder that we are now recording this meeting and it is being live streamed on YouTube for the public. The location of the recordings is due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic board members are each in their respective homes and places of work for the duration of this recording. I'd like to welcome all of you who have joined us today and to the members of the public watching on our live stream or later viewing the recording of this meeting. As we start all our meetings, I'm gonna start off with the land acknowledgement. And on behalf of the board, we would like to acknowledge the traditional land which we are virtually gathered in is Treaty 6. We would like to uh, thank the diverse indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as the Cree, Dene, Soto, Nakutusu, and Blackfoot peoples. We also acknowledge that, that this is the Métis homeland and the homeland of the largest concentration of Inuit south of the 60th parallel. It is a welcoming place for all peoples who come from around the world to share the Edmonton metropolitan region as a home. So uh, board members, we have an agenda before us this afternoon. We've got uh, two and a half hours uh, scheduled for our meeting today. I suspect it may take every minute of those two hours, but nonetheless, we will explore um, the issues before us uh, to the depth that is required before we move on. Uh, what I would like is a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Did I have someone make that motion? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Harrison. And, and maybe just using the raise hand function, that's how we'll do the votes here. I'll call for uh, the votes of approval of the agenda. And counting for Mayor, Mayor Ralph, and that's eight unanimous votes in uh, favor of approving the agenda. Thank you very much again. Now the next item is the approval of the minutes of the August the 19th, 2021 regular board meetings. Um, any errors or omissions that anybody would like to raise? Hearing none, could I have someone uh, offer to move that? Thank you, Mayor Ralph. Uh, uh, again, using the raise hand function, uh, the approval that the minutes of the uh, August 19th, 2021 regular board meeting minutes be approved as presented. And I'm counting eight uh, raised hands. Thank you very much. And that, that's uh, approval of the minutes. Mr. Chair, uh, yes, just sir. one thing, it's not really technical, but on page three, I moved a motion in that set of minutes of that meeting. And uh, for some reason, there's a hot link on my name that takes to a, an email address. There we go. All right, in my opening comments, uh, I neglected to maybe make the most important of announcements today. And I was to uh, welcome Councilor Knack to the board of the Edmonton Metro Transit Service Commission. Been appointed by the Edmonton City Council to uh, uh, succeed Councilor Michael Walters as the Edmonton nomination nominee to the board here. And Andrew, uh, welcome uh, to the uh, Transit Commission. Now you've been uh, around this particular course of, of work for as long as I recall. And, uh, but you've been a support to Councillor Walters and uh, 
and given that he is not running in the next uh, election, it is uh, appropriate that you take his place before the election occurs. And I, I certainly want to thank you, sir, for stepping to the plate and doing so, and uh, I welcome you to the board. And, and I know that you're not uh, 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 you know, a stranger to anybody on this board, but uh, I might give you a moment to uh, say a few words to the public, uh, should you choose to do so. Oh. Andrew? Oh, you want like some inspirational speech right now? I don't think I'll have that. Uh, just thank no you. pressure. <laughs> uh, no, just my thanks for uh, for this opportunity uh, to to join all of you. As mentioned, I've been following along uh, for some time through this work, with of course Councillor Walters uh, taking the lead on a lot of it. And I just want to thank him. He's done some incredible work over the years to get to where we are today. And uh, he, he leaves um, big, very big shoes to fill. Uh, not so much literally, you'd be surprised. I have very large feet uh, in, in comparison to him. But uh, uh, the work that he's done and the amount of effort he puts into the things he's committed to. So I just wanna offer my thanks really to him more so than anything and look forward to uh, joining the rest of you uh, for as long as I have the opportunity to. And uh, we'll, we'll see what happens come a month from now, but uh, if, depending on that, I'd love to continue being a part of this conversation. Thank you very much, Andrew. And uh, the interesting thing is, is uh, we all face that same sort of dilemma a month from now and wish everyone on the screen here the very best of luck uh, as you uh, seek to continue to serve your communities. Uh, a motion before us, um, that the board approved the election of insert name here is is really Councillor Andrew Knack. Uh, he's uh, taking over as uh, from the city of Edmonton and the city of Edmonton assumed the previous chair and uh, it was it would be appropriate that he continued to uh, uh, serve in that regard. The uh, the organizational meeting come uh, post the election. Uh, of course, we'll all have to revisit the, uh, the officers of this particular board, but nonetheless. Um, so uh, could I have uh, someone on the board move the uh, appointment and the election of, of Councillor Andrew Knack as EMTSC? Thank you, Councillor Sam Monkoff Swain. And it, it's really it, sorry. Go ahead, Councillor uh, Monkoff Swain. Yeah, no, I just um, happy to move the motion, um, uh, and, and great to have uh, Andrew joining us. You know, seamless transition from Michael being heavily involved in this from the start. So uh, happy to, to to move the motion um, that that Andrew comes on as uh, board vice chair. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jankowski. This is really not an election. I haven't called for. Um, you know, nominations or any of that sort. I'm wondering whether or not the motion should be approved the appointment of. Mr. Chair, we can certainly change that motion. Uh, although it shows up on the screen the way it is, we can certainly change the motion uh, in, in the record and in the minutes. Councillor Monkoff Swain, any issue with that minor adjustment? Happy with a friendly amendment, good, good catch. All right, thank you. Uh, any opening uh, comments then? Uh, you made your opening comments. Um, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Any other uh, comments on debate? Seeing none, again, using the raise the hand function uh, to approve the appointment of Councillor Knack to the uh, vice chair position. Uh, Mayor Ralph. <laughs> thank you, seeing eight votes. Thank you, everybody. Uh, that's uh, unanimous. And Councillor Knack, thank you for volunteering to continue uh, doing the work of the vice chair here for uh, the next uh, number of meetings. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, everyone. I really appreciate it. Okay. Uh... <laughs> The next motion here is, a, uh, is to approve the appointment, of, again, of Councillor Knack to the HR and Compensation Committee uh, 
member. I, again, we are all members of the committee. And uh, so in this particular case, uh, uh, Councillor Knack would be a, a committee member along with myself and uh, the chair would be Councillor Harris and the vice chair would be Councillor Munkoff Swain. So anyone care to make that appointment motion? Thank you, Mayor Ralph. Uh, again, use uh, any opening comments. Anybody want to enter into debate on this? I don't uh, go ahead, Councillor Harris. Or go ahead, opening comments, Mayor Ralph, and then we'll go to Councillor Harris. Um, I'm just going to uh, say that I support Andrew uh, uh, coming into this. He's been, I know that he's been keeping up to date and everything. And so um, it's kind of just to, it's just uh, to put him in this position to actually until after the election, anyhow. But uh, again, I believe that uh, he'd be a good person for this position. Thanks. Thank you very much. Councillor Harris? Yeah, and I'm glad that he made the comment about his big shoes um, because he, he, he definitely will be able to use his big shoes to help us with the weighty issues that we have before us from an HR and compensation standpoint. So welcome, Andrew. <laughs> we, we look forward to your, to your sober second thoughts on all of our discussions. So welcome. Great comments. All right, uh, hearing nothing further, using the raise the hand function, I'll call for the vote. All in favor, please raise your hand. And I'm counting eight, that's unanimous. Thank you very much again. Uh, okay, on to the next course of action, introduction of the Director of Finance and, and CFO. Mr. Jankowski, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm very happy to uh, make a, a similar announcement to the one that uh, that we went through with the Finance and Audit Committee on Tuesday afternoon, uh, but very happy and Lori Shea Smith, Lori, perhaps you can turn on your, your camera. Uh, very happy to announce that after an extensive search, Lori Shea Smith has been this, identified as the successful candidate and has uh, agreed to join this commission. Uh, and help build it up. I've been looking forward to the day when we have a, a finance prof professional sitting alongside as part of the senior leadership team uh, for probably the last three months, ever since we first started talking about the financial challenges that face this commission uh, relative to the uh, significant uh, ridership challenges that, uh, that we have all experienced over the course of the last uh, 20 months or so. Lori comes to us with an extensive background in the transportation and transit industry, but most of that was spent on the private side. She worked as most recently as, uh, I believe it was uh, an acting vice president of finance with uh, one of our major uh, private sector transit uh, employers in the Western Canada region. And uh, she's also spent some time on the pub in the public sector. She uh, did spend some time working for the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo. And uh, she comes to us with extensive financial experience on both sides of the fence, public and private. So with that, maybe I'll, I'll turn it back either to you, Mr. Chair, or to Lori, whichever way you'd like to uh, move forward. Uh, just want to introduce Lori to all of you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Jankowski. Um, uh, Ms. Shea Smith, uh, maybe just uh, say hi to the board and to the viewing public and uh, let us know a little bit of something unique about you, perhaps. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, this is day three. So uh, when I was introduced to the Audit and Finance Committee on day one, I was a little shaky, but today being day three, I've got some more solid footing and I really just jumped in this week and happy to work with Paul and Agatha and Brian, Deborah, and everybody else who's been supporting the organization for many months now. And I'm just really excited for the opportunity and to see your vision come to fruition over the next few months. So great time. Um, to be joining the organization as we're talking about building the budget, service delivery plan being, um, you know, becoming public today. So it's, it's a, I think, a perfect time to really jump in. So something interesting about myself, as you hear me speak in months 
going forward, you'll find out that I'm originally from Newfoundland. And so there'll be a little East Coast flavor, I'm sure, <laughs> that will come out. And uh, sometimes I'll say something and I will we'll get these stares and, and people will look at me and I'll say, oh, I think that that, that is something that's a, you know, a newfie saying. So you'll have to make sure that you check me if you don't understand what I'm saying sometimes. Fair enough. Thank you so much. And uh, for somebody who's, I've had the privilege actually of visiting Newfoundland twice. And I think everybody in Canada should, should uh, go. It's a beautiful province to be, uh, uh, to be a part of Canada. And so welcome and Thank welcome you. to the uh, Transit Commission. Moving right along, we, we're going to spend the bulk of today, no doubt, talking about the uh, draft transit service plan. And uh, over to you, Mr. Jankowski, and maybe just explain how you want to work through this and whether you want us to ask questions as we go along or if you want to wait until the end. Uh, just give us some direction in that regard, if you don't mind. Absolutely. So thank you very much for, uh, for the opportunity to come forward today, today with information that we have been working on for probably the last three months. Uh, you might recall that uh, through the early days uh, after I joined the organization, I spoke to the fact that we did need to take a, uh, a look at the proposed service plan, what it is that we're going to propose for the operations, the transit operations effective September 2022, uh, and that we needed to really take a look at what had been proposed in the business case, uh, adjust it and make the appropriate uh, uh, revisions to it based on the experiences that uh, we, we, along with all of the transit authorities across North America, uh, have experienced over the course of the last 20, 22 months or so. Uh, and uh, take a look at uh, what is a reasonable level of service that uh, we can deliver on, uh, at, on the ground on September, at the beginning of service on, on September 22nd, uh, sorry, September 2022. Um, this board approved the retention of two of the prime uh, service providers that were involved in the original business case work. Uh, and back in June of this year, you approved the selection and the identification of Andrew Anderson from Anderson Business Consulting and Aaron Toop from WSP. And I'd like to introduce both Andrew and Aaron at this point. Uh, Andrew and Aaron have been working with the transit folks from all eight municipalities over the course of the last two and a half to three months to really prepare what we consider to be a, uh, an appropriate service offering for the start of September 2022. Um, we also have been working with Ernst & Young. Uh, EY has started to work with all the financial people in the eight municipalities and have uh, started to collect the financial information relative to today's operations and also the, to, to look at what are the predicted financial uh, approaches for all of 2022, recognizing that the municipalities are going to continue operating the, the transit uh, operations for the first eight months with a transition to the EMTSC as of September, as of the, the, the beginning of the board period at the end, towards the end of the year. So over the course of the last three months, this team of Andrew and Aaron has met with the, the transit people. We've identified uh, the, and, and we're going to speak to two different elements of the start of uh, transit operations. We're going to speak to the local services that will be provided within each municipality. And we'll sp speak to, and what we hope to spend the bulk of time speaking about the intermunicipal or the regional services that we are proposing. Uh, so we've talked to the municipalities, the transit providers about both. Uh, and you'll hear through the presentation why we chose to chunk it up that way is that with regards to the, 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 being, the, the start, with regards to the local service, we're really not anticipating a significant change come September 2022 from what would have been operating for the first eight months of next year. The bulk of the effort has been focused over the last three months on the discussion around the intermunicipal or the regional offering. Back at the time of the original business case preparation, it's fair to say that 
the, the eight municipalities put together a robust plan that reflected the vision, reflected the optimism and, and the desires to create a, a truly integrated regional network. Uh, and this was done in the times pre-COVID when ridership was stable, it was healthy. The financial position did not have significant questions attached to it. Uh, most municipalities had been operating transit at a, an ever increasing level. Uh, and yes, there were some new elements that were added and that there was a, a vision to, to integrate those services and to add some new elements. As I came into this organization, uh, we, we spoke about the fact that there is a financial challenge that is facing us all. And uh, we have taken a sober second look at what it is that would be appropriate in our minds to start with as far as the interregional, intermunicipal uh, start of operations in September. We've worked with, and Andrew and Aaron have worked with all the transit people to look at what ridership is like today and to identify what kind of projections we might have uh, for, and when I say we, I mean we collectively across the eight municipalities for ridership at the beginning of September of, of 2022. Uh, we have had a number of individual meetings with the transit folks from the various municipalities. We have also had three significant workshops, and the most recent of which was last Friday. On September 3rd, on last Friday, what we shared with that transit advisory team was essentially a dry run of all of the information that is going to be presented to the board today. Uh, there was uh, extensive commentary that was provided. I believe that almost all the municipalities were represented there. Uh, there, there were, I think, one or two abstainers, but uh, almost all the municipalities were there. And certainly all of the information in preparation for last Friday has been shared with all of the municipal staff that, uh, that have contribute to what, contributed to what you will see in front of you today. Um, the one thing that has come up, and it's come up repeatedly, is that the, the overall network plan that was presented in the business case that was agreed to by all eight municipalities was a very robust plan. And to me, it continues to represent an end state. Uh, it, is, it continues to be our objective to get to that kind of robust network. Uh, what we're looking at and what we're going to be presenting to the board today is the starting point for getting to that network. And that starting point is, as I've said, influenced by the current realities that we face. There will be elements, I'm sure, that uh, as you start looking at the, the offering in front of you today, a number of you will question why isn't what we had back in the original service plan, why isn't that included? And Andrew and Aaron are here to address some of those questions. What we're really looking for is your input. What we're looking for is your feedback, how this fits into the subsequent stages uh, for the rest of the year, I'll just speak to a little bit. Today, we're presenting this as a draft. What, we, what we're seeking is your input. Uh, and I'll speak to the various elements that we'll speak to in a second, but we're looking for your input with the desire to take your input, reconsider it, and bring back a final proposed service plan. And admittedly, it's a high level service plan because we've only had two and a half months to carry out what would, in, if we were to do this in detail, it would take six to 12 months to carry this out. So it's a high level service plan. We're looking to get your approval so that we can then use it to craft and develop the draft 2022 budget and the three-year outlook that we need to prepare and get approved by this board by the end of this year. We're hoping to bring that subsequent draft budget forward to this board for the initial presentation mid-October. We will then take back any kind of uh, input that you might have with regards to the budget, reincorporate it, revise the budget as appropriate, and bring back the final budget in mid-November. So that is our timeline. That's how today's discussion fits into that preparation of that financial outlook so that we can all, we and the municipalities that are members, can plan for a, the, the financial realities for 2022. That isn't the end though. What we recognize is because this is a high level planning effort that you're seeing today, 
there is going to be at least four to six months of detailed service planning that will have to follow. So the plan is come the first and second quarter of 2022, that's really when we'll get out the, uh, all of the timetables with regards to service. We will sit down, we'll figure out what the schedules for each particular element of what you see today are going to look like, what the operating schedules look like. We will do the hard financial calculations to identify what are the, the, the run times, what are the, the uh, deadheading times, what are the costs associated with both of those. We will develop a very detailed cost structure and we will engage the public at that time in the discussion around the, the, the detailed service plans. What that means is that we will likely end up with a revised financial picture come mid-year next year. It also means that after we engage the public, we will be in a much better position to roll out the start of service, particularly of the intermunicipal, because that's the part that's going to significantly change from what you might be experiencing, what your riders might be experiencing today. That is the, the, the uh, information that we'll be working on over the bulk of 2022 in order to start service in September of 2022 under your guidance. So this is just the starting point. There's a lot of work yet left to be done. But a lot of the work that has been carried out over the last two and a half months has allowed us to bring forward to you a, a, uh, a high level service plan that we believe will help us set the financial stage for 2022 and beyond. The way that we're going to present this today, uh, and Mr. Chair, you asked, you know, how should we engage in the discourse? What I would ask is that you give us the opportunity to get through some of the introductory comments and move through an, a discussion or, or presentation of the principles that we believe are the right principles for us to build on as we start building the overall regional network. Once we get through the discussion and presentation of those principles, I would suggest that we pause and we get your feedback on those principles before we move on to actually looking at lines on a map and frequencies of, of service and that sort of thing. So I, I would ask that perhaps you hold your comments until Andrew and, and Aaron get to the end of the presentation of the principles. We'll open the floor to getting your input because we really want to know, did we kind of get these right? Are these the right things for our municipalities to consider for our riders? for our, our, uh, our tax taxpayers to consider as we start moving into the preparation of the lines of the map. We will then show you an overall map, which shows the entire region with the intermunicipal services that we are proposing. And we will then go through an individual line by line, line, line by line presentation. At that stage, I would suggest that perhaps once we've presented the, the service for each municipality. After each municipality, we will open the floor to the discussion. And then after the discussion, move on to the next municipal presentation. In that way, I think we can then collect the comments, collect the input relative to each intermunicipal connection. And we will finish off with a broad discussion about the overall network. At that stage, you will see much of the interconnectivity that has been developed between the, the intermunicipal services and the core Edmonton services that, that crisscross largely within the Edmonton boundaries. So if you can allow us to kind of present a bit, we'll open the floor to questions and input, we'll present the next section. And as we go through municipality by municipality, we will seek your comments as, as we present each one. Would that be a fair approach, Mr. Chair? I believe so. Uh, any comment from the board members uh, on how we're gonna manage the, uh, the conversation today? Okay, uh, we just wanna make sure that when the time is right, everybody gets a wholesome opportunity to, uh, to discuss their thoughts and opinions. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'm very happy to introduce Andrew Anderson from Anderson Consulting and Aaron Toop from WSP Canada. I'll turn it over to you, Andrew. 
Thank you, Paul. Uh, so just to confirm, I'll be presenting uh, from my computer. Yes. And everybody, everybody can see that? Yes, we see that. Okay, excellent. I will advance. Yes, thank you for your introductory comments there, Paul. It's nice to see um, all of the board members again. I know we've worked uh, um, many and many of you together closely in the in the past, doing the initial work in the business case as well as with your administrations. So uh, you know we're very honored to be invited back to do the next phase of work and to help put the uh, the life into the into the commission here. So we're 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 very thankful. Um, as Paul had mentioned, our schedule involves a draft presentation then a final presentation. And in parallel, of course, we're working very closely with Al Tom and the team at EY to make sure that the financial component aligns very closely. Just wanting to take us back uh, for a few moments to the original business case. We were very clear um, in our discussions and in our approach that we weren't starting with a, a blank slate, that we were starting with the foundation of being the business case. And that was really a commitment that each community, each member had made uh, about driving a seamless uh, integrated system that would be more consistent and uh, provide a better experience for riders, not just the riders of an individual community, but all of the riders that could be in Edmonton. And our thought was, if we are successful in this, we will build trust with the communities for further investment in public transit. As the public transit is successful, there will be further investment. There'll be then further opportunities for ridership and this virtuous cycle of investment would happen, which will ultimately benefit all of the people who live in the region. As Paul mentioned, we did spend a lot of time when we were gathering all of the current state information and looking at what has happened uh, since COVID-19. So all of the communities had a significant impact to ridership, both in terms of lost ridership uh, increased social distancing, meaning more difficulty to put full, full buses and additional costs uh, such, such as cleaning, um, additional labor-related labor costs. Uh, also, as we, we looked at them, we looked at the plans for 2021. What are the communities expecting in terms of a rebound? How are they forecasting um, service levels? And, and who is going to be the main uh, core uh, ridership market. So I know for any of us who've, who've ridden a bus lately, um, if you're over, let's say 30, you feel like you're old, uh, the core market is really going to be post secondary. Uh, we see that continuing. We see the U pass is really leveraging an opportunity for certainty in terms of revenue. And when we see these communities uh, where people are moving in to Edmonton or moving away from home to uh, attend school, now they have the opportunity to remain uh, at home and attend school, no matter where they live in the region. However, this challenge of a funding gap in terms of the additional costs and the, the more difficult way to deliver the service is only going to be resolved through collective advocacy. So there's been a lot of work through uh, CUDA nationally looking for additional consistent support and really recognizing transit as an essential service. There's still many people who have to travel to work. They are required to be physically present these are generally low wage jobs. And if there isn't an equitable distribution of service uh, and an investment of communities, then they, they will suffer. So our approach, as Paul had mentioned, starting in 2022 is really no significant changes to the local services. We're really focusing on providing more integrated intermunicipal services, which will be built off of a combination of existing routes, some with minor revisions, and then new routes that represent the collective coming together, creating new opportunities. And in terms of an overall governance, uh, and as we see the services being designed, one of the things that we emphasized a lot in the business case was that moving towards a standards-based approach using a design guideline and a transit service standard is really the best practice uh, nationally, internationally. Having services operate and then evaluating them, receiving feedback, looking at ridership, looking at equity, looking at land use parameters. And then as we measure operations, you can have that cir uh, circuit of continuous improvement. So we planned uh, review cycles as well as targets and metrics inside of the uh, transit service. It's not an official transit service standards for the commission, but our process for design was to develop a, a, a standard a draft standard based on all the municipalities that came together and then use and apply that to the design of the services. 
So in terms of local service, we just want to emphasize that it's about mobility, both within a community and access to the regional system. We've been very clear to define an interface point or a hub in each community where the local service could then connect, either uh, allowing people uh, through different modes to connect or having the service transition. But it's there's going to be a clear delineation point between a regional service and a regional service decision and a local service decision. And the importance, we don't want to lose the importance of local service. Local service is, is a key part. They have to work together, the local and regional services. That's the key way people are going to access the service. And there's also a lot of trip demands within the region that are local. So if people are going to have transit as part of their life, they're going to need to be able to do a variety of different types of trips throughout the day, not just the long trip in or out of Edmonton. So it's a very important that it works together, but those decisions need to be made at the local level. So we're anticipating future collaboration between the EMTSC and the local municipalities on designing local services. In our service guideline, and this you'll probably recognize this from, from the business case, we, we started to talk about, although it is a local decision, there's categories in how this could work. And there's a bit of a progression, although to be clear, all of these types of service would be to, seen together in a successful uh, community with local service. So at the very, we might think very basic level of access, you'd have a park and ride. You'd have an ability for people to uh, use their vehicle, get to a, a central hub. That creates some efficiency. It also means that the, the household needs to have a vehicle dedicated to that transit trip as well as, as driving. So there's a lot of challenge in, in getting people to do that, uh, or the benefits are, are sort of muted when you do that. Uh, then the next step is an on-demand local. So on-demand technology means people can use an app to order a transit service. The routing is flexible. So they might be given a uh, arrival window, and then they would go to either a stop or a pre-designed uh, virtual location where the service would pick them up. So this allows both an understanding of where people are coming and going to uh, at the local level, and it allows a, a much broader coverage area than a traditional transit service. And then the ultimate that we would want to see in communities is where we see density, where we see a lot of community activity, fixed route services. So those patterns will emerge into a, uh, a route that makes sense. Um, the thresholds, of course, on the service are something that we, you know, the communities will need to look at. But we see all three of these combining together for effective local services in a municipality. In, in contrast, or in, in, in um, I guess they want to work closely together, so we don't want to think that they're totally different. But they servicing the longer trip. So once they get to that hub from that local service, there then needs to be this regional bus. So this would be a more long distance trip. The very entry level that we're looking at is a peak only trip. So weekdays peak only would be uh, trips in the morning and then the evening, allowing commuters to get in for, generally for a work window or a, or a return to home on a school window. It's a developmental service. And so as we would see ridership, we would love to see more service. We'd love to see the midday fill out, the evenings. Um, in the guidelines, we talk about some of the thresholds that we'd want to see happen. As people use the service and rely on it more, they might be traveling at different times of the day. Uh, as we see the COVID recovery, the flexible work schedules, there's going to be more requirements for different times of day. And we would want to see that evolve then into this regional express service. So this is going to be the core service delivered by the uh, EMTSC. This is a 30 minute peak, 60 minute off peak from communities to central areas. So as these services grow, it could expand even onto weekend services to allow people to do uh, non-traditional employment or uh, other types of, uh, of, of recreation or other trips. Once we see those really strong accesses, you can imagine kind of in and out, then we're gonna start to see the cross town trips. So that's completing the full network uh, where we have people who are now relying on, on transit as their lifestyle. They no longer are worried about just simply their school or work trip. Now they want to get to all their destinations, and those could be in other communities. So we're going to see those circulatory trips around the region. We recognize that those are going to take more time to develop, and especially since the business case, this is an area where we put a lot more focus on what are the parameters that we would look at for a cross-town type service. So although the, the numbers could look similar in terms of a 30-minute peak, 60-minute off-peak, we would be more judicious in how we would introduce these new cross town type services. Um, and then the ultimate, once you have a lot of investment along a corridor, once you have a very high frequency 
you're going to get to the point where people are looking for spontaneous travel. They're looking for rapid uh, service. So this is based on the Edmonton guideline of, of rapid service. There would be limited stops, so it still is looking at that long distance, but it uh, allows when you have that volume of, of transit vehicles traveling there, when you have that volume of, of riders to invest in things like bike, uh, bus lanes, uh, wayside infrastructure, uh, bus shelters, transit hubs, you get a much better experience. You get people who are able then to make decisions to locate closer to these, these rapid lines. So that's ultimately where we would like to see a number of the, the lines in the community going towards a, a rapid line, but recognizing it does take growth and it takes a certain population to support that. So what I'll do now is I'll um, just give you a very brief overview of the five principles that we used. Um, and then I'll, I'll pass it on to Aaron, who's going to go into detail. Uh, these principles were how we did the design. So we used, obviously, the existing service, the current levels, and the technical analysis that had been done in the business case. But we relied on a principle-based approach to building this network so that it could be connected, provide a higher level of service, so that it could be fast, practical, and also reflect the bold vision of the EMTSC. So with that, I'll, I'll pass it on here to Aaron Toop. Um, I'll, let, I'll let Aaron introduce herself. Thanks, Andrew, and hello, everyone. And just to echo what Andrew said off the top of the presentation, I uh, really appreciate being here for this second wave of planning work. Um, so I'll walk through the five principles that Andrew just highlighted, starting with connected. Um, these principles will resonate a lot with the work that we did in the business case, um, but really these are looking at, again, that opening day network situation. and. There's one principle in particular um, that has kind of a, a 2022 flair to it, while the rest are um, stand both currently and long term. So connected is about providing service to downtown and post-secondary institutions with convenient one seat trips whenever possible, or no more than one transfer required within the network. And we're considering the network to be both ETS and uh, regional service. So this is important because the post-secondary market, as Andrew has said, is key for all regional municipalities and will be a very key um, piece of COVID recovery. Downtown Edmonton employment will also remain as a critical market. Um, and we've, we've aimed for one seat journeys where possible because this seamless travel experience tends to attract customers for longer distance commuting trips. Um, as a rule, we have planned for no more than one transfer required to access downtown Edmonton, University of Alberta, Grant McEwen, and Nate, knowing that those, those three post-secondary institutions um, are high priority for each regional municipality. So the next principle we have is higher level of service. And this really applies when there were multiple route options along a corridor, we look to consolidate them into single routes with more service. When we think of more service, we're either thinking of increasing the frequency of that service or potentially increasing the service span being the time of day in which that service operates. Um, so higher frequency and increased span allow for more ridership opportunities, um, for people to access the system at different times of day. And then higher frequency tends to support higher level of infrastructure investment uh, in key transit corridors over time. So that would be the aim. FAST is, is a key principle because we want to plan for express service that provides a competitive travel time between high ridership stops. And so we know that long distance trips across the region require a fairly competitive travel time to the automobile to attract new riders to the system. Um, and we really also wanna focus on providing efficient and fast service for those who rely on transit to move around the region because we don't want them to be penalized by kind of a slow moving system that they are captive to. This practical principle is about focusing on kind of what we know is occurring in 2022, as well as providing efficient staging of transit service in congested areas. And so then anticipating any major construction on key roadways as needed. So this, this takes the opening day lens. Um, we reduce the risk of service reliability issues in downtown Edmonton due to typical congestion. And Andrew's gonna talk more about how we applied that principle when we look at the, the downtown 
area and how the routes align there. Um, we also considered the upcoming West LRT construction in downtown Edmonton and how that's going to affect major corridors and have planned around that. Um, so attempting to account for some of these major initiatives that we know are happening in the region. And then our last principle was to be bold and to connect high potential transit destinations with new intermunicipal service. So we know that new service opportunities may emerge uh, when we take a regional lens on the transit system and some opportunities may have been less apparent previously. And an example of this is the ability to leverage the commission's capacity to develop service such as the airport to downtown Edmonton Express, which again, we'll get to when we talk about some of the key components of the transit network in the next section. And I believe there's one more set of principles that we want to chat about. And this is just a reminder of the foundational financial principles that will kind of tee up the next stages of the financial analysis that Paul talked about. And so the idea that the regional transit services will be shared among the eight municipal members of the commission and allocations for the regional service costs will be developed for each regional route based on the municipalities that will benefit from that route. Um, also reaffirming that the local transit service that is operated by the commission will be funded exclusively by the local municipality in which the service operates. So I think this is the end of our, our principal section. And so then at this point, let's pause and um, open it up for discussion and questions. Okay, over to you members of the board. Uh, anybody uh, care to have any questions of Mr. Jankowski or Mr. Anderson or Ms. Troop. Uh, Councillor Monkoff Swing, over to you. And then Councillor Ayers. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Wes. And, and, and appreciate the uh, the input here and, and, and the background conversation. Um, so got a few comments here. So so, so bear with me. Um, but off the top, let me just state that, you know, I, I Paul, when, when Paul came to the to the board to talk about a review of the business case, given the pandemic, I absolutely supported that and, and, and recognize that we needed to do that. I am um, aligned with the principles that are presented, that they make sense. Uh, um, I support where we're going with that, so it's a good work. Uh, however, the, the plan that's gonna be presented to us is, uh, is actually a significant departure from the business case. Uh, and, and I don't think it's reasonable for us to go through this conversation today um, without understanding the numbers behind the decisions. Um, I haven't seen them, my administration hasn't seen them. Um, and yes, we went through some principles and, and that's great to guide it. Um, but there is, as I mentioned, a, a significant departure from, from what we were looking at. Um, you know, I, I appreciate um, Paul giving uh, me a heads up in advance of this conversation, you know, but um, so for me to be able to give it a quick look. Um, but from my scan that the plan that is going to be presented here is, is, um, is not what we built as a region. Um, it, it's not what we went out to the public with. It's not what we went to our councils with. Um, our administration, yes, we're involved in some workshops, uh, agreed. Um, but th this final one, you know, the, the run through on, on Friday uh, and then the, the information coming out, it's just not enough time for our administration to, to really take a look at, at this. And, and for me to be able to, you know, we're giving the agendas late and so then I don't have enough time to be able to consider this to be able to provide input. I recognize this as a draft, but you're not going to get any um, any uh, prudent information or input from me um, just, just from presenting it because I haven't had a chance to, to go through it and more importantly, I don't know the finances behind it. Um, you know, I recognize this is a tremendous challenge to Paul. I mean, you, you, you've had one staff um, for, for a while and, and yes, you're getting support and, and I really appreciate the work of, from Andrew and Aaron. Um, but our transit professionals, you know, they're, they're, they're there um, and, you know, they're offering in-kind support um, and for, for them not, not to have seen the numbers of, of where this decision comes from is a challenge for me. Um, I, I really think that we need to have that financial data in their hands um, to be able to review it before I, I can provide any, any input here. Um, you know, I, I'm coming here obviously with a regional hat on, um, um, but to, to give an example to my board colleagues of, of where my frustration and concerns are coming from here, um, I'll, give the, I'll give a bit of an example around Beaumont. And I know, Paul, you wanted to, to have this conversation coming up here, but 
I, I don't think it's worth spending the next hour and a half going through these these conversations because um, I'm not going to be able to provide the input. So I, I, I've got a recommendation at the end of this. So Beaumont, um, for, for those who don't know, we, we have a system that currently runs now. The, the last bus leaves at 7.30, goes into Edmonton, and then we have a, a, a bus in the afternoon, 3.30, coming back. We've got no off-peak service uh, and no weekend uh, service. Um, what, what's going to be pre presented and what was di discussed at the business case um, was that um, that Beaumont would have that off-peak service throughout the day uh, and then on the weekends as, as well. Uh, and there was also the, the airport uh, route um, that, that, was, uh, that was on the, on the system for, for Beaumont as well as Devon. And I know I haven't seen the map, I haven't put the map up, but what the map is going to show is that not only is the airport route dropped off, but so is the weekday, uh, the weekday off-peak service and, and any weekend service at all. So basically where, where Beaumont is, is in the exact same place um, where we have been today. So we're just joining this, uh, being part of this commission, just essentially as an add-on. There, there is no change in service. Um, you know, the, the commentary um, as part of the presentation says there were minor, re minor revisions to the, to, the bus, uh, to the business case. Yeah, that's pretty significant. Basically, Beaumont is in the exact same spot. So I, I recognize this as a draft, but again, I want to reiterate that um, I don't understand and haven't seen the finances behind it. And you're not going to be presenting them today around the decisions around why to remove some of those off peak Why did the weekends go? Why did the airport routes go? And, and the answer can't simply be because we're in a pandemic and a ridership is down. We've got to understand the numbers behind it. So I know it's not what people want to hear right now, um, but I, I think I think Paul, you and your team need to, to sit down uh, with the administration and, and run through the financial um, background around it. Um, yes, the principles are great. I get those. They're guiding us. I understand that. But ultimately, you're coming at this with a financial decision um, where you're looking at this saying, we, we're making these changes, uh, significant changes from the business case. Um, we're we're making those based on, on finances and, and, and low revenue. Okay, that, that's fine. But I, in order for me to give that comment, I, I got to be able to see that. So um, personally, you know, I, I, I don't think it's worth going through this next part of the conversation. Um, I, I think that as a board, we, we should be directing um, Paul and, and team to go back and, and prepare that information. So, um, you know, I had the conversation on Tuesday and I don't like to spring this on, on folks here now, I uh, had a brief chat with a few people uh, on the board here, but didn't have time to, to be able to um, provide this. So apologies for springing it on, but um, ultimately my, my position is, is that we're, um, this is way too important a decision um, to, to be given two days kind of heads up notice on um, and, and no understanding from the financial background. Um, because what's going to come from here, as Paul mentioned, is review the draft and then bring back a final plan. Um, I don't think we've got enough information to have that. So. Um, Wes, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, apologies for, for um, potentially disrupting this. Um, but, but for me, um, I, I got to understand better than um, a pandemic uh, creating a loss of revenue. I got to understand more than that for, for me to provide any, any real input into the process. So um, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Okay, fair enough. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Sam. I, you know what? Never apologize uh, for for raising concerns for your community. I, I, I hear where you're coming from and uh, I point well made. Uh, and, and for board, we, we desperately need to get this right coming out of the gate here because this, this is sort of the stepping stone to future success. And if we don't get this one right, our foundation will be shaky. So I, I, I recognize the, uh, the uh, time constraints that you're under, Mr. Jankowski, in terms of preparing budgets and stuff like that for 2022. Um, however, I think uh, as well that, uh, you know, Councillor Monkoff Swain has made, a, has made a good point here. So before we go too far on, uh, further on, I think we, we need to discuss this as a board and then, um, and then give direction to our administration. Um, Having said that, I'm going to turn it over to Councillor Harris for his comments, and then maybe we'll enter into discussion around what uh, Sam has brought forward here uh, to come to some sort of resolution in that respect. No, I don't know what lens uh, uh, Councillor Muckoff-Swain looked at it, 
that we're probably all looking at somewhat the same. I see this as an evolving process to ultimately get to a confirmation of what the numbers are. Uh, but if we look at, given the constraints that we're all operating on at the present time and likely to be operating for quite some time, um, what, what I will say in the first instance, and then I'll, I'll be expecting a comment from Mr. Jankowski relative to the process, but um, I, I think the principles that have been espoused today and that are helping to guide uh, the development of the service plan will ultimately allow us to develop a cogent uh, financial analysis of the cost of services going forward, which, which I believe will more than uh, adequately explain to Councillor Muckoff Swain uh, what it means to his community, what it means to all of us. So um, I support the, um, the identification, the alluded, uh, you know, the, the statement of the principles that have come forward. I think we are not in a perfect world. We're not in a world of a stable uh, nature. And so therefore, what are the principles on, uh, on, on which we are going to uh, deal with the, uh, with the services? From a local service standpoint, um, we're gonna pay for what we, what we want. If we choose to raise services, we will pay for that going forward. If we lower the services, we will pay for lower services, I would expect notwithstanding the overall overhead costs that we're all gonna to have to pay to have a commission as a board. Um, so I guess the question that I've got, I support the principles. I think that's good guiding process that allows us to look at it. There are changes and unfortunately Beaumont uh, has probably the less, least um, kind of developed transit service in the region. And we all have to be acknowledging uh, the various levels that we do enjoy or will come to enjoy in the future. So my question to Mr. Jankowski, um, Mr. Chairman, through you uh, to Mr. Jankowski, um, are the principles ultimately then going to allow us to then get to the state where Councilor Muckoff Swains um, will have the information in which he can individually and we can all collectively determine where we're going with this? Is, is, it, is it a step along the process and this is merely to frame it so that we can then uh, launch into more of a kind of a robust financial uh, analysis. Uh, so that's my question to Councillor or to uh, uh, the Executive Director. So, Mr. Chair, it is a step in the process. And uh, what we were hoping to uh, get from the board, and, and we're getting it now, is the input, good, bad, unvarnished. <laughs> we, we were hoping to get feedback on the principles that we used to establish kind of the baseline. What we were planning on doing, given the very tight timeline, is to use the information that went into the preparation of this baseline and then to cost it, to, to come up with the financial cost to deliver the services that you to deliver the services that you see shown on the subsequent slide on, on that map, uh, come up with a budget relative to those costs come up with a financial allocation of the costs to the various municipalities. As um, uh, Councillor Harris has indicated, there is a different formula for allocation depending on whether it's the, the uh, local service or the intermunicipal service. We were going to work the, the service plan that you see behind you or you see that, that we're, we're trying to get to into the development of those costs, bring them back. Now, what I'm hearing is that there's concern, certainly from Councillor Munkoff Swain, and I certainly heard it from staff this morning at the City of Beaumont, there is concern about some of the elements that aren't there. So given that, we can certainly develop the additional costs as we're going to, to kind of add in some of the enhanced services that could be added onto with the specific costs associated with those enhanced services. What you're seeing today, and you might remember back in the preparation of the original business case, there were essentially three buckets of service with a, a different cost allocation formula for each one. There were the local costs, the local service with the local cost being allocated to the municipalities within which that local service would be provided. 
there were the intermunicipal or the regional network that would where the costs would be allocated basically on a on a, a, a principle of beneficiality so whoever whichever municipality benefits the most from a particular leg they the costs would be allocated in in that type of proportion that's certainly the way the business case was originally developed and then there were the enhanced services and so they they, they were identified as those services that could be added onto the basic intermunicipal or regional framework. What I'm hearing from Councillor Monkoff Swain and from the City of Beaumont staff is that they believe that the, 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 the um, intermunicipal regional framework, the, the intermunicipal network that we are proposing is not sufficient as it relates to the original business case. So while we have put together what we believe is is something that can be costed at, at, at effectively the same sort of pricing that was in place prior to, or that it's in, in place now at the start of 2022, we can certainly identify those additional elements that have not been uh, included, those elements that were in that service plan that was in that original business case and in the June 2020 version of the business case, we can add those on and we can provide the costing relative to those as part of the financial framework that uh, that we will bring forward. That That is certainly an iteration that we can engage in. So I, I think I've answered your question, Councillor Harris, but if there's something more specific, I I'd be happy to uh, to try again. Yeah, so in answer to uh, Councillor Muckoff Swain's concerns, the information will be readily available in due course. And that today we're looking at how you're framing a response to a very challenging time in uh, transit planning everywhere. And uh, uh, that you're talking about adding some, some additional service on to ensure that the service that they enjoy eventually will be a service that they expected to enjoy eventually. Because when I look at this, I like the principles, I like what we've done. And so we've got, we've got a little bit more robust service than they have because we have a local service as, as we most, most of us do. And um, I liked what that looked like and how our local service would interconnect. And, you know, like when we chatted the other day to get from Fort Saskatchewan to Grant McEwen, you could do that. Uh, without even having to get on the LRT at Clairview, you can take one bus and transfer once and you're there. Meets the principle. And so that would speak to my colleagues about a, a, um, a principle that we're meeting, which I think is really critical. It's, so it's objective-based decision-making, which I think my colleagues in Fort Saskatchewan would find very important. So it's not willy-nilly, it's not arbitrary, and it's not subjective, it's, it's totally objective. And if, if that's the basis for where we are, then I think the conversation today is reasonable for us to have with the proviso that um, administration is going to be bringing back the ramification to satisfy Councillor Muckoff Swain. And I think the rest of us, because we're all, we're all having to answer to our councils who have agreed to sign on to this endeavor, which is, you know, we're, we're making it up as we go fundamentally against what we thought was a reasonable business plan going forward. Now, that, those assumptions have somewhat changed, of course. So um, you've answered my question, Mr. Jankowski. Um, I, I don't know if it answers Councillor Muckoff Swain's concerns, but I see that if, it is a, if it's a journey we're taking, this is the first step. The next step will provide better, um, a better view of the landscape, so to speak. So. Uh, that's really all I have to say about it. And I, I'm comfortable with where we are today personally. And I think we're getting there in in a measured context. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Back to you, uh, Councillor Monkoff Swain. Then I got Councillor Finstead and Mayor Ralph. Thank you. So first, let me just say, I'm not opposed to the principle-based principle -based discussion. I'm there with you guys. Absolutely agree. But what's keep talking about is these additional services for Beaumont. And that's just, that's just not reality. We had a business case, which had all the services. So I, I'd ask you folks to consider what if, you, if the map came out and all of a sudden there was no route from Spruce Grove or no route from Fort Saskatchewan on here. Um, and then now we're like, oh no, we're just building. We're just looking to build this. And, and the, the information being presented as well, 
we, um, we, we need to we need to look at our costs. Um, you know, I think what should be in front of us is give us the financial cost for what the business case was, right? Show that and then show, okay, we actually don't think right now, we don't think we can afford a route from Devon to the airport. We don't think we can afford that route from Beaumont to the airport and walk through that justification. But put, put yourself in, in, in my shoes for, for a second. Um, the, this is a complete departure from what we looked at. So um, I would, I would again, th these are talked about as additional services, but it, it, what was presented to the public and to, the council, and to our council and to our public is is completely against us. I, I don't know if I would get four votes um, to, to be honest for, for this because it's the exact same thing. And the reason why we're in this is that so our stay-at-home parents or our seniors don't have to rush to catch a 7.30 bus in the morning. Uh, our university students, we've got a class that starts at 12. We all know they sleep until 10 a.m. anyway. They, they missed the bus, so now they're driving it. So all the principles that Beaumont got into this for have been gutted in this proposal and have been gutted because of a financial decision. You know, Paul and team looked at this and said, you know, we can't afford to do off peak right now for Beaumont. We can't afford to do um, weekend service for Beaumont right now. If that's a decision, fine. I'm happy to go and have that conversation as a board, but I haven't seen the financial, the, the finances to get there. So my input, my feedback is going to be, um, th th there's no point in me, me sharing it because I don't, I don't understand where that, where the numbers have come to put us in that position. So um, yeah, that's why I don't think it's worth having this conversation today. Um, I certainly am not going to add any value uh, to, to it. Um, uh, I, I understand the principles on there, um, but we need to understand either come back with the base case and the finances there, and then you can come back and say, actually, we think we should drop off weekend service here. We should drop off this route here and show us how those numbers work. Um, but you can't put that map up um, and uh, and show, um, you know, my, my council is going to be watching this meeting. Um, and, you know, I, I'm nervous that they're going to see a map that that is all of a sudden got roots taken off and everything like that. So that, that's where I'm coming from. I don't think it's worth us going forward. I think there's more work that needs to be done so we can make informed feedback to the board. So I'll leave it there, uh, Chair, and uh, ha happy for others to weigh in. I'll uh, just ask people to think about what would what would it be like if, if all of a sudden the map um, didn't show a route from your area uh, coming into coming into the city. Fair enough. Councillor Finstad. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the principles do make sense. Uh, I agree with them wholeheartedly. Some of the concerns that I have or that we and Leduc might have would be more operational in nature. And I think we need more discussion with uh, administration just to say, hey, here's some, here's some issues we need to contemplate uh, <clears throat> in terms of start and finish points, in terms of where do the assets get stored, maintained, and keeping in mind that we are under certain contractual obligations at this point that we don't want to jeopardize, and we don't, you know, we want to make sure that the uh, the base costs for those services aren't increased because of a decision to move maintenance or or move uh, storage or move whatever to another another point. So. Uh, principles are great, and I can understand uh, Councillor Munkoff Swain's frustrations. But the whole point of this exercise is do we have the basis to start to prepare that financial analysis? Do we have the basis of, of uh, taking this as our base level of service and working the numbers around it? So it's kind of that chicken and egg thing. What do you do? Do you come up with a budget first and try and make your, make your services fit the budget? Or do you decide on what services you want and then allocate the resources, financial and otherwise, to that in order to plan? And ultimately it's gonna take us the next couple of three meetings in order to get to the, the final starting point, if you will, uh, because without this information, <clears throat> we can't prepare the, the uh, budget process. We can't approve a budget if we don't know what the service levels are the expectations are and is it a matter too that each of the uh, outlying communities if you will have higher expectations of service than perhaps uh, is realistic at this point in time and only the numbers are going to tell us that so from my perspective uh, principles are fine I think we do need to have more discussion with um, with Paul and his team with our with some of our uh, individual municipalities to uh, 
really get the expectation set down and, and get a few of those operational type questions answered from my perspective. Thank you, Councilor Finstad. Mayor Ralph. Uh, yeah, I actually just briefly talked to Paul about this yesterday, but the, you know, the uh, I guess maybe somebody could actually fill me in a little bit more on the, on the Devon route, because when I first sat down uh, at the table with, uh, with the commission, we started talking about routes and everything. There was two areas we were looking at. We were looking at going west and we look at looking at going uh, to the airport and then into, into Edmonton, the South Edmonton Common area. Um, and then I sort of stood back and put another counselor on the on the on the uh, on the, in uh, in the commission here to work through it. And the trip to the west disappeared. And the comments when I did come back were, well, we didn't make any sense to do it at this time. Um, so you know, it's something we can look at in the future. So, and then when I get the when I see the maps that came out, the west is back on, and now the airport is gone. And my concern is we're actually on next Monday signing a contract with that ETS for a test service for the next three months. And we're going to be running to the airport and then into Edmonton, into the LRT station there, um, which is, again, based on the decision that uh, was made or talked about when the plan was put together. Um, but, it, but as I say, now it's changed that it's going to the West End. I understand the reasons behind it. But the frustrating part about it is we've, we're signing a contract for basically the next between now and 2022 with ETS to put this service on and we're paying it, all of it out of our pocket. And are we just shooting ourselves in the foot now because we're going to be testing in one area. And if we when we go to the commission, we're going to be going the other area. So it's kind of like, what are we doing here? Um, that's kind of my comment, because I know that. Paul's been working and you're supposed to be work, like you're working with our with our administration and everything. But from a council perspective and from me sitting on sitting in the in the initial discussions and everything, I thought the West was the best way to go because there was an opportunity to, with Enoch and picking up Enoch and, you know, working with the First Nations and everything. But I, it was thrown right off the table. So how did it get back on, I guess, is my question. And now we're sitting in this type of situation, which in my opinion is not good when we're going to sign a contract on Monday night with ETS. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, great commentary. I think this is part of what you wanted uh, coming back to you. I know Mr. Jankowski and uh, Mr. Anderson, Ms. Uh, Troop, uh, is this sort of feedback. I, My heart actually goes out to both the... Uh, Councillor Monkoff Swain and to Mayor Ralph because uh, the the presentation of the business case to their communities it was almost like a promissory note based on a certain understanding of joining the commission. Uh, now, truly, we're in a different world today than we were two years ago. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, to your point that you've made, uh, Sam. Uh, yeah, if there was if there wasn't a line between St. Albert and, and Edmonton, uh, I, I'd be echoing uh, some significant concern as well. So, so Mr. Jankowski, uh, we, we need to acknowledge uh, Councillor Monkov Swain's and uh, Mayor Ralph's uh, sort of concern. I think you also have heard. Uh, unless somebody else would like to speak to it. And I'll get to you too, uh, Councillor McKenzie, uh, some support for your principles. I think your principles are certainly um, well-founded and I haven't heard any uh, uh, negativity in that regard, but, but certainly in, in how it plays out, uh, this is the hard work of, of, of building something uh, from nothing, <laughs> which is what we're doing. But in, in a sense, it's from nothing, but in a sense, it's not because there was a history in the past and there is a presentation in the past. And so th there's expectations that were established in the past and we, we have to uh, find our way forward to make sure that those expectations are addressed in a way that uh, makes sense to people. And we just need to do the work in order to have that happen. Uh, Councillor McKenzie, over to you, and then uh, Councillor Knack, and then back to you, Councillor Monkoff-Swain. Sorry, Mr. Chair, if I could just, uh, I 
I didn't uh, didn't mention it, but I do support the principles. Okay, so I just wanted to go back to that. I didn't make those comments. So, okay, thank, thank you. you. Sorry for interrupting. No, it's okay. It's all good. Councilor McKenzie. Yes, thank you. Um, I guess I'm I'm struggling a little bit now, <laughs> uh, Councilor Markov Swain. You've uh, you know made me look at it a little bit differently, but yet I still believe that we should be. It is uh, moving forward and trying to assess, you know, and look at the costs. That's our, that will be the next step. However, if we are losing some of our um, key connections or that sort of thing, I, I'm struggling with it. I know um, when we look at the Regional Express One for Stony and Spruce, and uh, not to speak on behalf of Stony, but the Spruce Grove has its own local route and you know that right now is not being shown or considered and I, and I understand that but currently right now Stony Plain has introduced a local route but within that local route is a, the connector component between Stony and Spruce out onto Yellowhead versus the 16A you know similar to the Devon, Devon question so I guess by approving today and moving forward or, or, or how we're, we're going, would it's not necessarily completely tying us to that is the route or, or is it, is I, is I guess my question. Because I don't know if I've really understood where we're actually standing at. So Mr. Chair, if I may. Go for it, <laughs> Councillor. So, Chair, Councillor. So, uh, what we're looking for at this stage and where we were was to try to figure out whether we got the principles about right. And I'm hearing so far generally that, yeah, it sounds like the principles are about right. What I'm also hearing is that even though we wanted to present the map and present the, the various elements and explain them, I'm hearing that there's already concern that is uh, being voiced relative to A, some changes that we had identified and B, some elements of the original business plan or business case that are not represented on that map. And what I'm certainly prepared to do, um, recognizing that this may take additional time, certainly prepared to undertake the, the costing and the financial analysis of multiple scenarios. What we were working towards was developing a single service plan scenario and then doing all the detailed costing and bringing it back. I'm, rec I'm, I'm very cognizant that we've got a very short timeline, a very short runway to get accomplished what would normally take essentially a whole year uh, or maybe even longer. So our, our intent was to try to present a service plan with the various components that, that are represented there, uh, present that, get the feedback on that service plan, and then engage in the detailed preparation of the financial framework and the, the, the budgetary suggestion for next year. I am hearing clearly that there is some desire for us to also cost those elements of that original business case that aren't included. And we can certainly attempt to do, to do that. Uh, I'm cognizant, however, of the fact that there is going to be time required to cost and allocate costs for the various scenarios that might be envisioned. So it might be kind of a piecework uh, approach. Uh, Mr. Chair, we're, we're at the board's uh, disposal. We, we will certainly take direction from the board as to what it is that the board would like to, to see coming forward. Um, it, although there's going to be more work required uh, and it might require multiple iterations and it might impact the timeline, we are quite willing to take the board's direction direction on this and uh, I'm absolutely committed to making sure that as has been mentioned that we get this right for opening day and th that that's the ultimate desire here is to make sure that we've got a fundable approach to service levels and to services for opening day. Um, Mayor Ralph identified a certain question and you've identified a certain question with regards to uh, individual network components we can certainly look at alternatives. We can identify the impacts of going with alternatives. And I know that Andrew has been positioned, he's kind of itching there, I can see. 
crazy. A, a lot of the discussion around ridership potential for one route versus another, that has been considered. Uh, we're at this point where we can get into the presentation of this route by route, or we can uh, continue to have a higher level discussion about where we might wish to go. I'm at the board's, um, I, I await the board's direction on that. Fair enough. Thank you, Mr. Janikowski. Uh, before we move on, we'll certainly uh, come to that conclusion. Uh, I've got uh, Councillor Knack and then Councillor Laurie, and then back to you, Councillor Monkoff Swain. All right. And Councilor before Broadhead. I leave you, uh, yeah, go ahead, Councillor McKenzie. Yeah, can I just can I just yes. make a comment to that? And and thank you, Mr. Janikowski, because that's kind of how I was feeling. Like to me, when I see it, and I think the problem is when you see the map, you assume that that's kind of that's the end all be all. To me, you know, for, for looking at Express One, we want to get from Stony to Spruce. We want to get from Spruce to Edmonton and to Nate is our first stop. And that that makes sense. You know, when we look at is it eight trips to to Stony and the, the 26 to Spruce, those sorts of things, I think as we as we go along and, and Spruce Grove is we've had that back and forth with Yellowhead and, and 16A and that 16A route has been on and then off again and on again. And you know, you try to grow it over time. So I personally, uh, I'm ready to move on at the higher level I, for Spruce Grove. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor Neck. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So yeah, I just wanted to briefly acknowledge, yes, the principles seem to be right on, so I don't really have anything to add there. Um, based on the discussion, it sounds like there might be some value in, in getting some of that additional detail. I can, I can see that from the perspective of some of the other members who have spoken up today. Um, the only other thing I was going to add and something that you and I chatted with briefly and just wanted to share with the rest of the group is that I was, and I know, uh, unfortunately for, for a variety of reasons, Mr. Janikowski and I weren't able to connect over the last two days where I think everyone else had a, a session. So I'm very much feeling like I'm coming into it a little bit dark, um, uh, because I wasn't able to set up one of those one hour sessions as I was in council meetings. And so not having had that and having not had, um, the feedback of our of our transit experts has been a little challenging, uh, but I recognize that today wasn't going to be a final decision day either way. Um, so I don't know how much to, to Councillor Monkoff Swain's point. I don't know how much value I could add specifically today on on these slides as I am looking at them now for the first time and um, without without some of the expertise and guidance. So I mean I could throw out some comments similar to. Uh, what Councillor McKenzie was talking about. I mean, uh, with the Yellowhead going to be under construction for many years, is that the right route for Regional Express One? I, I don't know. Is, is is it better to get a couple of those options that have been asked for, and uh, and then a bit of that additional expertise and, and guidance to help inform our conversation? So I I don't know. I think one of the earlier comments is is, is this a chicken or an egg? And I actually don't think it is. I think it can be both. I think we can get some of those options. And we can start doing the refining as we have that. We, uh, that I feel like this group is is ready for that challenge. And if it means um, taking on some additional work from our end too to make sure we've sat down and had those meetings and work through this, so that we're not the reason that anything's being held up, uh, I, I'm ready and willing to to partake in that. So just wanted to offer that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Uh, Councillor Laurie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, very similar sentiments as, as many of the colleagues on the commission here in regards to the principles. I think the principles are fantastic. I think they're spot on. And, and I think that is, you know, our, our end goal. Um, but I really can sympathize with Councillor Monkoff Swain uh, when I look at Stony Plain and, and some of the changes that have come in for Stony Plain. Uh, when I look at our current service, what is versus what is being offered now, and I'll give it an example. Uh, we're talking about regional service coming to Stony Plain eight times in a day. Right now we get 12. So it's actually a reduction in, in service level, or it re then requires us to keep a secondary regional transit service going. As, as Councillor McKenzie mentioned, when we integrated our local transit, we didn't integrate it as local to Stony Plain. We integrated it as local to the tri-region. And part of the understanding and as these presentations went on to our council was that the EMTSC or the, and then the RTSC was essentially going to take over the regional aspect of connecting Stony Plains, Spruce Grove, Edmonton and beyond. And that Stony Plains local service, even operated under EMTSC, was then going to help feed into that network. 
So, you know, I, I have expressed a lot of these concerns already to, to Mr. Jankowski. I've expressed concerns about the mapping. And, and again, same to what was brought up by Mayor Ralph. We see mapping in the original business case. Then we see mapping in the amended business case. And now we see mapping here again. And the routes have bounced back and forth and back and forth. And those amendments happened because of feedback that was previously given. And now it seems like those have been reversed. And so it's very difficult to understand why that's happened. Um, again, when we talk financials, you know, if, if we're talking that this map that we're seeing today falls under the same financials as the maps that were in the previous business case, now we understand that the maps that were in the previous business case would have a significant increase under today's conditions. However, I'm very curious, is, is this a map that aligns to those same financials or not? And, and how do those look? Um, as Councillor McKenzie mentioned, you know, there was the RE2 that was previously in there. And when I look at the old charts as to the percentage of responsibilities onto each municipality and, and how would that fall and how is that going to change? And, you know, those were the, the, the presentations that were made to our councils. And, and those were the decisions that, that people's decisions were based on. And so, you know, I go back to thinking about our original planning sessions and, and the hours and hours and hours we spent in the ballrooms and looking at maps and drawing on them and consulting and going back and forth over this. You know, I, I feel, although I understand why these changes have been made, that to this point, even to get to the draft, there really wasn't input. And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that with the feedback that's being given, Mr. Jankowski and the rest of the administrative team will be able to continue to work this forward to something that is amicable and amenable for all of us. Um, but I, I do think there is a lot of work to be done before we get there. And, and I don't think that's going to be accomplished in just the, the feedback ability we have today. Okay, fair enough. Thank you, uh, Councillor Laurie. Uh, Councillor Mark Hopswin. Yeah, thanks. And I'll be quick because I know we want to move on here. Um, I just want to, two key points. First, uh, I'd encourage folks um, to refrain from using the word original business case. Uh, the business case we had some time ago is what we have today. Any changes to that run through the board and, and we, we go from there. It seems that language is used, that that change has already been made fait accompli. I know that's not the intention, um, but just, just the language is important. Um, you know, Wes, you said we're in, a, we're, we're in a different world today than we were, were two years ago. I completely agree. All I'm asking for is someone to, to show me the numbers behind behind it. It should have been presented. Here's the original business case. We don't think we can get there. Therefore, we think we need to take these things down. Um, all, all, all we've got is, um, you know, we've lost our service and, and I don't know why. Um, but but to move forward, um, if if folks want to talk through their routes and their different routes, I suggest we do that and, and go through. Um, I, I certainly won't be commenting on the Beaumont um, uh, area because clearly there, there needs to be more work done. But if there, there, there is feedback from others, I don't want to um, hold this up any longer. Um, but I, I, I would, um, you know, I think you've, you've heard it, um, but I, more work needs to be done with, with specifically with, with uh, my administration to figure out why the airport route dropped off. Um, and, and what the financial decisions behind getting Beaumont service before I come back and, and provide any feedback on it. Because I want to get to that conversation, but I need to know the information behind it. So I'll leave it there, Wes. I appreciate uh, the board giving me um, um, the, the, the opportunity to, to share those concerns um, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll carry on with the conversation. Thanks. Well, I uh, appreciate that, uh, Councillor. I've actually, I appreciated the idea that you brought it up because if we didn't deal with it, um, it would just it would be an issue whether we liked it or not. We have to reflect uh, the reality that our expectations in our communities. And so this is the hard work that we need to go through. It doesn't mean it's bad work. It's just hard work and it takes time. Uh, quite honestly, uh, I'm going to I'm, what I'm going to suggest is that uh, Mr. Jankowski, you take the feedback that you've gotten so far and and then we move on uh, not going through the individual routes today and here's my rationale for that we're we're uh presenting in public and the 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 minute the maps go up uh for public cons uh, consumption they will be uh viewed as the the plan if you will and if we are clearly going to be re-looking at what that might be and uh, coming to a position where we can speak to that 
uh, to the rationale behind the, the, the map that will eventually be in place, whether it is what it is today or whether it's changed in the future, we need to be able as, as board members, as councillors, be able to speak to that within our communities and within our council chambers. So I'd hate to have to have misinformation out there uh, prematurely. So what I'm suggesting and I'll propose to the board and then you can uh, reflect uh, back to me whether you agree with me or not, is that we, uh, at this point in time, we direct Mr. Jankowski and his team to go back to work with our municipalities so and give us the information that's been asked of, the financials so that we can understand where we're going and be able to explain that to our constituents and then come back at the next time uh, a little bit more prepared for that. And then we move into the in-camera portion of our meeting and complete that today. That would be my proposal here. And that'll give uh, uh, Councillor Monkoff Swain and everybody else, not just him, but everybody else on the board, an opportunity to truly understand what's before us and what it means to our own communities and what it means to us as a region in light of what our original expectations are and in light of what is being proposed today in light of the very real uh, financial uh, considerations that we're all facing. But we can't, we just need to be able to understand it to uh, Councillor Monkoff Swain's point. And we need to be able to explain it to our council colleagues and to the community when they ask. So, uh, I would suggest we leave this particular part of the meeting at this point in time and then bring it back at our next meeting. And at that point in time, go through the detailed uh, routing design because then we'll be pre presenting it publicly and then move on to the in-camera portion of our meeting. Uh, any comment on that? Is, is, does this sound like wisdom or am I, <laughs> am I spoken something here? I don't know. I just. <laughs> Uh, let's start with Councillor Mungod Swain, then Councillor Finstad. Yeah, so for, first, um, uh, thank you. Um, you know, working as a board, um, you know, I think this, this shows when these when these issues come up, and, and I appreciate it. I feel as though I've been heard, and, and really appreciate that you, as a, as a chair, for looking at that. Um, and again, I know you said not to apologize, but I, but I will. I I really wanted to have this conversation today, um, but with the information I got. Um, I just I didn't think it, it was appropriate for us to do it. So, um, you know, hopefully this is the will of the board that this is the direction we go. But I uh, appreciate your your chairmanship anyway to to get us through this piece. Um, thank you, Wes. All right, thanks, Sam. Councillor Finstad. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I concur that we uh, just sort of halt the process at this point, allow administration to collect the the data they need from the various municipalities in order to come back at, at a later date with, uh, with a proposal and with a uh, indication as to perhaps what some of the cost implications might be. And I, I fully realize that it's very hard to prepare a budget until you've got your service levels finalized, uh, which is the conundrum that we've, uh, that Mr. Uh, Jankowski is in. But by the same token, I do think we do need to pause. I do think we need to be able to provide the additional inputs from each of the municipalities and just help uh, administration with the uh, making the best presentation possible at a, at a future date. Thank you, Councillor Finstad. Councillor Harris. Sorry, clicking, clicking the wrong buttons doesn't get you. You know, I guess I saw this as a matter of process uh, that we have some information. It, 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 I guess my only concern is the tight timelines to get the information to us is something that I would have raised in any regard, because if we don't have enough time to review these materials before the meeting, then we end up in these types of conversations because mem some members aren't, aren't comfortable with the data and the information. But I do respect the fact that our administration working under pretty tight timelines. Mm -hmm. So then the question, Mr. Uh, Jankowski, is, Mr. Jankowski, how long will it take you to do that relative to when our next meeting is? I, I, can't, I can't see you're going to get that done. Uh, so what would you say is a realistic timeline and respecting the fact 
we don't have that many more meetings. So we're gonna have to probably have some special meetings if we want as this board to move this thing to the next logical decision point or information sharing point as the case may be. So that's my question to Mr. Jankowski because we have to be respectful of, uh, of the impact this means to them and to the consultants that are engaged to help work through that process. So thank you. Um, that's something we're going to have to analyze and get back to the board on. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing the discourse, I'm hearing the dialogue and back in June, we had set upon that, that timeline that uh, Andrew did put forward. Um, the, the, the plan had been to build a service plan then to go through the costing and the financial allocation. What had informed today's presentation was some of the background knowledge around existing ridership and that fed into an analysis of demands that fed into uh, a, a, a financial outlook, if I can put it that way, but the detailed work was going to be done following today's discussion and, uh, and direction from the board. Uh, on various elements. We were going to refine that service plan and get into the hard hard uh, costing uh, and, and financial analysis. I, I hear the desires of the board uh, with respect to kind of car carrying out now, I, I'm kind of thinking about it as a parallel set of calculations, as a parallel analysis. Uh, it is work that uh, will be additional to the scope of what we had originally envisioned. Uh, I am going to have to sit down with our financial uh, analysts. I'm going to have to figure out exactly how much work that is. Uh, and I am fully committed to bringing that information back to the board, given the direction that I'm, I'm sensing from the board. Um, I, I'm unfortunately at this point, I'm not in a position to comment on timelines. You're, I, I, I will request your indulgence and uh, I, I'm going to have to sit down with folks and figure out exactly how much work this is, what information is available, what, what additional information needs to be collected. Uh, and effectively, what we're talking about, I think, I believe, is is sort of parallel plans, one, one very similar to what was in the original, uh, the, the June 2020, or the existing, as Councillor Munkoff Swain has indicated, the existing business case, given that we haven't yet revised it, and then a, a parallel costing effort associated with the service plan that more or less we had suggested. Um, and we're also going to have to disaggregate the collective financial analysis and also look at the costs associated with specific elements that have been raised. Uh, so that is that is an awful lot of work in my uh, in my opinion. Uh, and, and it's work that you know it's obviously the board is indicating that we want to have that considered. We will we will put together a revised work plan. Uh, it is likely to affect as Councillor Harris indicated, it is likely affect to affect the schedule of the meetings that we had put forward. But more importantly, it's, I, we're really going to have to take a look at what does that look like relative to the desired objective to have a, a finalized 2022 budget. I, I would ask the board's indulgence to let me do that. Let me have those discussions and bring that back. Uh, and perhaps in working with the chair and the vice chair, bring that back along a revised timeline. I hear you, Councilor, or, uh, <laughs> um, Mr. Jankowski, certainly hear you. We, we definitely need to give you the time that you uh, need to do this uh, in, in the revised uh, process that we're sort of describing here today. Uh, Mayor Ralph, uh, comment? I don't, uh, on the Devon side of it, I don't want to complicate it. It uh, takes you a lot longer just to calculate out ours. I'd just like you to work with our administration to make a decision on whether we're going to go west or we're going to go south. Um, that's all I'm asking because uh, once we start a program, we start paying for it, which is very shortly. I want to make sure that we're investing the money where we should be. So, uh, you know, so I think that uh, that's something that could be discussed uh, fairly quickly, I'm hoping, Paul. Yes, that you can work with our administration. So, um, but as far as uh, as far as Beaumont is concerned, you know, we there was a business case, there was there was roots pled and everything, and that's what was presented. So I don't think that it's I myself personally 
you've got at least an idea of what what you need to work on and look at look at the costing i know it's going to take you a little bit longer but it's not like we're starting from scratch either so uh, as far as the routing is concerned so i know it's going to take you a little longer which i again i completely understand because you got to do some cost analysis and everything but again to be fair to beaumont i think that uh, we need to we need to have a better understanding uh, because that is what was sold to his community and his residents. So, uh, but, and then we go from there. So, thanks. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, to the board, I, I got to tell you how much I appreciate the conversation uh, because there are going to be moments along the life of a, of a commission or an entity like this where we have to deal with with the questions and how we do that is almost more important than the fact that the that the uh, decision is done and information is provided and i i just want to commend the board on on how uh you've managed the the, the discussion today and to you uh, mr jankowski and to uh, mr anderson and ms troop uh thank you for the work that you've done you've got a little bit more work to do and uh and that's the nature of the business that we're in. And uh, I, I just don't want anybody going home today thinking that, oh my goodness, that, that wasn't worth it. It absolutely was worth it. And we need to go through these things in a holistic manner in order to get to where we need to go at the end of the day. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Monkoff Swain for raising it. And and it's not, it's not just you, it's everybody that needs to take a look at what we're uh, going through as a commission. And at the end of the day, we want to stand up and, and be able to say, this is the very best product that we can put on the table, given our resources that we have. And, oh, by the way, it's going to be better than if we did it by ourselves. So anyway, th those are my thoughts. And uh, whoever put this, uh, this motion up, <laughs> uh, clearly understood where we were going to go. Uh, would uh, someone care to move this motion and then we move along? Uh, Councillor Finstad, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Board accept the information as presented and direct administration to appropriately consider the board's input in the finalization of the 2022 transit service plan for September 29th, 2021 presentation to the board. Okay, just before I accept that, uh, Mr. Jankowski, the date of September 29th, do you want that changed, removed, or how, how do you want to manage the date? So if I can make a suggestion to the board, uh, I think that second bullet point, perhaps given the dialogue and the discussion, uh, it would better be amended to read something like consider the board's input in uh, the, the presentation of a status update with regards to the 2022 transit service plan to be provided to the board in the near future, something like that. I think we're going to have to look at both what, what it is that we're going to bring forward and the timelines for that. Okay, can you, can you do the status update for the 29th? Yes, we can certainly do that if we want to leave that date. It is scheduled in everybody's calendar, so we can make use of that date. Okay. I'm very happy with the revised motion. Okay, so instead of finalization, it would be the status update. Right. Okay, uh, Councillor Knack, comment? Uh, maybe that covers it. I was just going to say, I mean, I don't know if it was more appropriate to just refer this item back for some additional, for based on the conversation we had, but I think the rewording is okay. So I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. All right, Councillor Finstadt, uh, as amended, then uh, any opening comments? No, not really. I think it's been a great discussion. I think a lot of points are covered and uh, we certainly didn't as a board mean to derail the process, but I think uh, this is gonna give us a, ultimately a better product, one that uh, will have less questions, I think at the next meeting. So I think this is a very worthwhile exercise. Thank you for that. Anybody else care to comment? Councillor Monkoff Swing? Yeah, so uh, just a, a thank you to, to CEO Jankowski there. I appreciate the um, 
the, the willingness to, to listen and, and, and hear the input here. Also really appreciate the, um, the conversation prior to, uh, to kind of get my head wrapped around it. Um, and then uh, at least I, I wasn't a, as surprised as I would be just showing up here. So um, the, the communication uh, between us is great. Really, really appreciate that. And, and I know my administration and anyone else's uh, will be excited to, to get a better understanding of, of some of the financial decisions around that and looking forward to the update on the 29th. So I uh, really appreciate the discussion today. Perfect. Any other comments? Any closing comments, Councillor Pinstead? No, I'm good, thanks. All right, using the raise the hand function, uh, a call for the question, all in favor? And that is approved unanimously. Thank you very much, uh, board members. Mr. Jankowski, you, you have your marching orders? Thank you. All right. Now uh, on to the next phase of our meeting. Uh, we have a, a motion before us to move in camera. Uh, Councillor Laurie, did you want to make that motion? I certainly can, Mr. Chair. I'll move that the board move in camera in accordance with the provisions of Division Two exceptions to disclosure of the Freedom of Information and Privacy and Protection of Privacy Act (FOIP) RSA 2000 CF 25 as per Section 16 through 28. Thank you very much. Uh, before I ask for your opening lines of debate, uh, Councillor Moncoff Swain, you had a raised hand. Uh, do you want to comment here? Okay, fair enough. Any opening comments, uh, Councillor Laurie? No opening okay. comments, thank you. All right, I'll call a question. All those in favor going in camera? And that's unanimous. Thank you very much. All right, we are now in camera. Uh, Agata, I'm assuming you're going to set up a breakout room for us? We are now reconvening in public and the recording has started again. And uh, we have a motion coming out of our in-camera session. Um, and that that one was, that's the one motion we can make in camera is to move out of camera. And that was passed and now we'll move on to the next one. Ah, okay, here we are. All right, would someone care to make this motion? Councillor Laurie, uh, it's appropriate that you as uh, the chair of the Audit and Finance Committee make uh, this motion, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I will move that the board accept as information the material and discussion as presented in camera, approve the principles of the lease agreement as presented, and direct the board chair and CEO to negotiate all terms and execute all agreements necessary to enter into the lease of suite 300 in 106th Street Tower reflecting the approved principles of the lease agreement. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, accept that motion. Any opening comments? Definitely, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to say that, uh, again, as we come to the first of uh, many firsts, as we go through this, the creation of this board and, and the commission, and as we move forward, it's fantastic to see the potential of, of our first real home. Uh, as Mr. Jankowski said, we've been gracious to have two offices in the Edmonton Chamber of Commerce building uh, that we have very quickly outgrown. And so being able to uh, have the prospect of a place to call our own for the commission to reside for the next several years uh, is, is fantastic and just another great step forward. So uh, appreciate all of the work that's gone in from administration to get this together, especially in the, in the timely manner that they have. And uh, from everything that we've seen, I'm very excited about it and, and looking forward to what it will allow us to continue to do with this commission. Thank you very much. Any others on debate? Seeing none, I'll call the question using the raise the hand function, please uh, uh, all in favor. And that is unanimous. Thank you very much, 
Mr. Jankowski, you have your marching orders in relation to this. Thank you. All right. Here's the best motion of the day. And uh, we're three minutes earlier. Who would, who would like to make this motion? Way too many hands, I see that. I thought that was automatic by the chair. It is actually. So I'll move the adjournment of the meeting and uh, thank you very much everybody for a, uh, a really good meeting. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Bye. Ciao. Ciao. Thanks all, take care.